Welcome to the class. In the previous classes, uh, you have engaged with Edward Said's Orientalism, a path breaking work uh, which had contributed to the emergence of certain important lines of scholarship in social sciences and uh, humanities in the post 1980s. Um, of course, uh, like any ambitious and influential scholarly works, Orientalism has also re received a lot of admirers as well as critics. And uh, since you're familiar with the work of Said and his arguments, uh, what I have in my mind today is to introduce some of the important criticisms received by Orientalism. Uh, you can find a lot of works uh, that have critically engaged with Orientalism. And in my opinion, uh, some of the important criticism and very interesting criticisms too uh, come from the Marxist uh, school of thought. Among them, uh, two scholars demand our serious attention, uh, Sadiq Jalal al and uh, Aija Sahmad. Uh, Sadiq Jalal al is a Syrian Marxist philosopher and Aija Sahmad uh, is one of the foremost Marxist thinkers uh, who passed away uh, recently. So, um, in this class, I will be briefly revisiting the core arguments and larger significance of Said's Orientalism and the criticisms the work has received from the Marxist scholars. So, uh, what is Orientalism? Said has argued that one can find uh, Orientalism at three levels. And you must be remembering this, that as you have uh, engaged with uh, the introduction of Orientalism in great detail. So, uh, he identified Orientalism at three levels. First, as an academic discipline or as a knowledge base created through anyone who teaches, write about or research about the Orient. And second, as in Said's own terms, Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and the Occident. And, and I'm sure I don't need to explain this again uh, as you have uh, uh, discuss this in detail in the previous classes. And again, the third definition of Orientalism, according to Said, is the practical action done over the Orient politically, ideologically, militarily, and scientifically. And uh, you must be remembering Said arguing in the introduction that uh, this kind of Orientalism is a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the East. Uh, I don't think I, I need to explain these arguments again and again, as you have already gone through these points in detail in the previous classes. So, uh, what are we focusing here today is the larger significance of Said's work, or uh, what has been what he has been trying to achieve through these arguments. See, uh, Said explicated how a particular body of knowledge uh, that is Orientalism contributed to the spread of European colonial rule and how its influence has extended to every other domain connected to uh, imperialism, colonial history, race and political identity. So in one sense, uh, he is trying to conceptualize the relationship between Western imperialism and Orientalism. Then, uh, what is this uh, relation? Uh, Vivek Chibber, uh, in his essay, The Dual Legacy of Orientalism, uh, points out that there are two arguments in Said's work about the relationship between Western imperialism and Orientalism. And the first argument is coming from a, a quite familiar line of reasoning. It describes Orientalism as a rationalization for colonial rule. And, and you know this, it means that Orientalism as an ideology has emerged as a rationalization or justification for colonial rule. And Seyth traces the origin of this form of Orientalism to the 18th century. It emerged with uh, what is popularly known as the Second British Empire uh, that continued till the Cold War era uh, when United States the states has displaced the British as the global hegemonic power. And during these centuries, between 18th century to late 1940s, uh, 
Orientalism flourished as a body of knowledge that not only described and uh, systematized how the East was understood, uh, but it was also used to justify the colonial domination in the East. So uh, how did they do it? Conceptualizing uh, the Orient and the colonial subject as uncivilized, irrational and non-modern, a quintessential other of the civilized, rational and modern West, it argued, uh, the discourse of Orientalism argued that colonialism is here to civilize the Orient. The colonialism is here with a, a burden, the burden of white man. So, doing so, the discourse of Orientalism absolved imperialism of their, uh, you know, all the violences they have unleashed in the colonial countries because it is their civilizing mission. It is the white man's burden uh, to civilize the uncivilized, irrational and non-modern Orient. So this argument is quite uh, familiar to us and you have, this, you have discussed this point in detail in the previous classes as well. It is a materialist explanation for how and why the ideology of Orientalism came to occupy such a prominent place in European culture uh, in the modern period. This explanation maintains that like any system of domination uh, that creates an ideological discourse to justify and naturalize its superior position, colonialism also created its own legitimizing discourse. That is the discourse of Orientalism. So in this argument, it is colonialism that created Orientalism. Or in other words, Orientalist discourse comes after colonialism as its justification or as its rationalization. Chibber would say that the causal arrow of this argument runs from imperial domination to that of the discourse it created, that is Orientalism. So, uh, in a one sense, he is saying that colonialism came first and Orientalism followed as its justification or uh, rationalization. Uh, but again, this is uh, more of a conventional argument and Said was not the first scholar to make uh, such an argument. Uh, so, there were others like uh, um, Said Hussein Alatas, uh, Franz Fanon, Ami Sisser, uh, Anwar Abdul Malik, etc. Uh, who pointed out that uh, much of the scholarship produced by the colonial ruling class has justified the rule over the Eastern uh, people and Eastern nations. Uh, Said himself wrote about this uh, in an article titled Orientalism Reconsidered, uh, which uh, appeared in the journal uh, Cultural Critique in eight, 1985. So if this point is something that is already discussed and well established, then what kept Said's book apart? And obviously, it was not just the argument he made, but uh, as Chibber rightly points out, it was the erudition and the literary quality of uh, Said's work. Uh, however, Edward Said has also uh, makes another argument in this book that actually reverses the causal arrow that we have just mentioned. It uh, takes the argument to a new direction and in this version, Orientalism was not understood as a consequence of colonialism, something that came after colonialism as its justification, but rather one of its causes. So in this version of the argument, it is not colonialism that produced Orientalism, rather Orientalism has produced the cultural conditions uh, that are conducive uh, for colonial rule uh, to happen in the uh, oriental nations or in the third world countries. And to quote Seth, to say simply that orientalism was a, a rationalization uh, for colonial rule is to ignore the extent to which colonial rule was justified in advance by Orientalism rather than after the fact. It means that Orientalism was around far before the modern era and uh, its characterization of East in a particular way as uncivilized, uh, non-modern, irrational, etc. has produced the cultural conditions for the West to embark on its colonial project. So 
uh, what is the important uh, importance of this argument if orientalism was there even before uh, modernity or colonialism uh, where is its origin seth traced this form of orientalism back to the classical period in europe to the works of uh, homer aeschylus and other thinkers and according to seth it continued through the medieval period and culminates in the great works of renaissance and after and this is this is an important point and this implies something important so what is it it says that um, orientalism is uh, not so much a product of the circumstances specific to the historical conjuncture rather uh, it was something embedded deeply in western culture itself uh, see uh, he is uh, trying to say that orientalism was there even before colonialism it is not just something that emerged as a consequence of colonialism or as a or as a justification or a rationalization for colonialism uh, it was there uh, since uh, homer the great uh, ancient greek thinker and runs through what we considered as the great literature of renaissance so in, in all these literary and scholarly writings uh, you can see a particular depiction of the mysterious and unchanging east a uh, contrast to the familiar and dynamic west and this is something this is something interesting and that we have to keep in mind so uh, how does uh, said uh, push this argument or how does he uh, substantiate this argument to push this argument said makes a distinction between two components of orientalism uh, that is latent and uh, manifest orientalism and the latent components are its essential core its basic moral and conceptual architecture uh, which have been in place since homer and these components defines orientalism as a discourse and manifest elements are what gives orientalism its form in any particular era and hence uh, the manifest components undergo change in the course of history and this is this is an important distinction that said said makes and i will explain why uh, in a minute this distinction between latent and manifest orientalism helps said to argue that as a discourse orientalism has not remained unchanged across space and time and he did point out that the nature of orientalism or the western conception of the east in its form and content has undergone significant changes over the period but the changes have only been in the ways in which orientalism was expressed in different contexts the essence of orientalism or its latent components has remained more or less same across the centuries from uh, since the time of homer to the modern period so this is an important point and this distinction we have to keep in uh, keep in mind so um, the latent orientalism goes beyond simple bias towards the east and becomes a practical orientation uh, which is an urge to bring the reality of the east in line with the ways uh, in which west imagine what the world should be or what the world ought to be and it is simply uh, the idea that the modern rational and civilized west has the burden of civilizing the despotic and irrational and uncivilized east and for said this practical stance has been a defining characteristic of the orientalist mindset from antiquity to modern era in spite of all the changes that it experienced across time and said is not saying that orientalism was an unchanging discourse from the antiquity to modern era rather it has changed its forms and it condenses across space and time but more or less the core of orientalism has remained same it is it is a form of a particular western mindset and that has remained unchanged over the centuries that is the uh, crux of said's argument 
So uh, the Western culture or the Western mind, uh, say it says, has always characterized the East as inferior. And it's just it's not just a modern phenomena. It, it was always like this. So from a simple bias towards East, it moves, the Orientalism moves towards gaining knowledge about the Orient and acquiring power over it. Why it is uh, so important or uh, interesting? Uh, we need to discuss that a little bit. This uh, second version uh, of his argument actually inverts the first, uh, that is the materialist explanation of Orientalism. And in, as you, uh, you might be remembering, in the first argument, it is a system of domination, uh, that is colonialism, is creating its justifying ideology, that is uh, Orientalism. And in this argument, in the second argument, the causal relation inverts. Here, the ideology, that is Orientalism, is in, is in some way responsible for the rise of European colonialism. And Orientalism is no longer uh, one of the consequences of colonialism. Rather, it causes, it, it kind of produces the cultural conditions that is conducive for the West to embark on its colonial project. And uh, this is obviously a novel take by Edward Said. And most of the critiques of Orientalist constructions at that time uh, had typically been materialist uh, in their nature and was grounded in political economy. Said's originality is in offering a culturalist alternative to the existing approaches. And it is this argument that displaced materialist analysis uh, with the culturalist one. And interestingly, this was the argument that was deeply criticized by many scholars and uh, especially by uh, Marxists. And uh, I think uh, this point is clear and uh, I have uh, kind of tried to summarize uh, some of the core arguments of Orientalism uh, in the uh, first few slides. Now, uh, I want to introduce um, two early critiques of Orientalism, uh, Sadiq Jalal Alism and uh, Aijaz Ahmad. Uh, Sadiq Jalal Alism is a renowned Marxist philosopher from Syria. Uh, he was a professor of philosophy at uh, the University of Damascus. And he was uh, author of so some of the important books, uh, including uh, Criticism of Religious Thought and Secularism, Fundamentalism and the Struggle for the Meaning of Islam. His criticism of Said uh, first appeared in the magazine called Kamsin, uh, which was a socialist magazine published from France. And his article, Orientalism and Orientalism in Reverse, uh, published in 1981 was uh, one of the earliest critical engagements with Said's work. Sadiq Jalal Alazam also reiterate that one of the most uh, vicious aspects of Orientalism, as carefully pointed out by Said, is the deep-rooted belief that there exists a fundamental ontological difference between the essential natures of the Orient and the Occident. And this difference and this uh, ontological difference sees Western societies, cultures, uh, languages and mentalities as essentially superior to that of the Eastern cultures, societies, languages, etc. And we just saw that uh, Seth traced the origins of Orientalism all the way back to Homer, Aeschylus and other ancient thinkers implying that Orientalism is not really a modern phenomena, rather it was a natural product of an ancient and almost irresistible European mind to misinterpret the realities of other cultures, peoples and their languages, etc. Uh, for the occidental self-affirmation or the self-affirmation, the dominance and ascendancy of the West. Uh, so, for Seth, the European mind, uh, whether it is Homer or Descartes, uh, whether it is the Orientalist historian uh, Hamilton Gibbs or the revolutionary Karl Marx, it is inherently misinterpret and distort the realities of the East. That is, uh, that is an essential uh, characteristics of the European mind, according to Seth. 
but but what is the problem with a, such a pro, such a perspective the problem is that tracing the origins of orientalism to the european mind simply lends strength to the essentialistic categories of orient and occident so what does that mean uh, when we say that uh, it is inherent within the western culture or western mind to misinterpret the realities of other cultures especially the east uh, in favor of uh, west on uh, self affirmation dominancy and ascendancy we are making a claim that there is an ineradicable ontological distinction or a, a ontological difference between the east and the west actually it is this highly problematic distinction that sage's book uh, orientalism tries to demolish uh, i don't need to explain this further you have engaged with this particular point in great detail in the previous classes so what was sage trying to achieve uh, in in orientalism his magnum opus uh, he was trying to demolish the distinction between uh, east and west uh, the distinction that was made by the orientalist scholars that uh, the essential realities of the east and west is different and the west is considered modern rational uh, civilized etc and where the east was considered a non modern uncivilized despotic uh, etc so said was trying to demolish this essential categories of orient and occident this distinction this ontological distinction between east and the west so but when he says that uh, orientalism is a deep rooted uh, cultural disposition that is uh, there in the western mind uh, from the time of homer and it runs through uh, the medieval period and culminates in the uh, great literary and scholarly writings of renaissance he is basically saying that uh, uh, orientalism is a, a western mindset it is deeply rooted in the western culture so in a sense uh, when he uh, conceptualizes orientalist discourse as an unchanging component of western culture he is actually again reinforcing this distinction uh, the distinction between uh, orient and the occident and this is what sadik jalal alazam calls orientalism in reverse so rather than demolishing the binary between the east and the west say in a in a way uh, accidentally reinforces it again uh, so this is uh, one of the major criticisms uh, raised by uh, sadik chalal alasam and a uh, similar criticism were also raised by aija sahmad against say uh, in one of the most landmark essays uh, he has ever written orientalism and after uh, the ambivalence and metropolitan location in edward say and uh, this uh, essay appeared in the celebrated work uh, in theory classes nations and literature and this work has also uh, attracted a lot of uh, attention from uh, scholars uh, within various disciplines uh, including uh, literature uh, sociology history uh, comparative literature uh, etc so uh, this essay of aija sahmad Uh, makes so many important criticisms uh, especially critical comments on said and uh, orientalism in particular so um, i don't think we can explain uh, the major all the major points that he is raising in this essay and i only want to focus on three important observations of ahmed uh, and it is related to the methodological and political consequences of locating orientalism in the western mind or in western culture rather than among the consequences of colonialism so as uh, sadik chalal alasam uh, aija sahmad is also uh, critiquing the second argument the culturalist explanation said has given for orientalism the first uh, and most important criticisms um, raised by aija sahmad against said is related to the uh, methodology said used uh, in his work 
uh, Orientalism. So what is this? Uh, one can identify that uh, a sense of affiliation with Foucault remains strong throughout Said's work. So Ahmad's criticism is that the second argument of Said that we just discussed is influenced by Foucault, but Said refuses to accept the consequences of Foucault's own mapping of history. And this is a very complex but also very interesting point. So uh, what does this mean? Uh, we will uh, explain that in a minute. In his work, Said identifies Orientalism as a discourse in the Western culture or in other words, uh, rooted in Western episteme. Uh, there are two important terms here, discourse and episteme. Uh, what is a discourse? Broadly, uh, one can argue that uh, a discourse is a um, historically constituted uh, system of uh, thoughts uh, composed of uh, ideas, attitudes, uh, some courses of action that is practices, uh, beliefs, etc. that systematically construct the subjects and the worlds of which they speak about. Uh, for example, Orientalism as a discourse is a set of idea, practices, beliefs, etc. Uh, that was emerged over a period of time and it creates specific forms of knowledge about the East, uh, the Eastern world, uh, its people, its languages, its culture, etc. Also, a discourse legitimizes the power relations of that particular historical period and produce uh, what is considered to be truth and knowledge. And uh, this discourse of Orientalism, according to Said, is rooted in Western episteme. And what is episteme? That is also something that we have to uh, explain a bit here. A an episteme, according to Foucault, is a set of unconscious rules that govern all discourses and forms of knowledges in a society in a, in a, a particular historical epoch. It, uh, it actually determines what does and what does not get seriously uh, taken in a society. So in another sense, episteme represents the condition of the possibility of the existence of discourses. So Orientalism as a discourse exists because there is an episteme. And in this case, the Western episteme. It is a, a set of unconscious rules that sees this discourse of Orientalism as legitimate. And why this episteme is called Western episteme? Uh, Foucault would say that this episteme is constituted historically in the West uh, in the processes that range from uh, roughly the 16th century to the 18th. Uh, in the emergence of what we uh, call as the bourgeois society or uh, in other words this period the 16th century to the 18th century is also known as the period uh, which runs uh, from the so-called primitive accumulation up to the first industrial revolution so what does this imply it says that the western episteme is historically constituted in the modern period and uh, it is uh, constituted in what we considered as the modern epoch and it's thoroughly a modern phenomena. So the Western episteme actually makes a clear cut distinction between the ancient regime and the modern world. It is a shift from the ancient regime that makes the Western episteme possible and it is historically constituted in the modern epoch or in the modern period. And this is the uh, idea of Western episteme by Foucault. Say uh, uses this Foucauldian idea of Western episteme. And uh, as we have already mentioned, for him, the Orientalist discourse is rooted in this Western episteme. But interestingly, Said refuses to accept the consequences of Foucault's own mapping of history. So that was our initial point. The, uh, the criticism that raised by Aicha Sahamad. So how does uh, Said refuses to accept the consequences of Foucault's own mapping of history? 
because in say the western episteme starts from the classical period uh, with the writings of homer and other greek thinkers because he traces the origin of orientalism all the way back to the classical writers and all the way back to the ancient greece said assumes a putative continuity of western history from ancient period uh, to the modern epoch and thus and he uh, traces western episteme from ancient europe to modern europe and this is uh, not only an unfoucauldian idea rather it is antithetical to foucauldian framework and as we have said for foucault western episteme is thoroughly modern phenomena it makes a clear cut boundary or a clear cut demarcation uh, between the ancient regime and the modern world and foucault would not agree with said uh, when he uh, takes western episteme as something existed from ancient greece uh, to modern europe for foucault uh, the western episteme has its origin in the bourgeois society or in other words the western episteme according to foucault is uh, thoroughly modern it is actually this foucauldian pressure that uh, forced said to trace the beginnings of orientalist discourse from the 18th century in his first argument and not in the second one in the first argument he traces the beginning of the orientalist discourse uh, to the 18th century but in the second argument it changes uh, when he identifies orientalism as a, a mindset a western mindset or deeply rooted in the western culture he traces its origin uh, all the way back uh, to the uh, ancient period in europe to the uh, greek thinkers like uh, homer aeschylus uh, euripides etc so um, as i said in the second argument uh, in which he traces orientalism to the classical period to homer and others he is actually going against foucault's own mapping of history foucault's own idea of western episteme and this assumption of a putative continuity of western history uh, according to aija sahamad is coming from a, a humanist tradition that said alludes to but this is questionable uh, as the humanist tradition said adheres to is not only uh, unfoucauldian rather it stands in direct opposition to the foucauldian framework that uh, said used uh, to uh, understand orientalism as a discourse rooted in western episteme the second issue uh, ahmed has with said uh, is that the idea of orientalist mindset introduced by said was so pervasive in its scope um, as even the most radical critics of colonialism were treated as people with orientalist prejudice the most prominent figure in this regard was uh, obviously called marx and said's portrayal of marx was heavily questioned uh, not only by aja sahmad but also by other marxist thinkers uh, like uh, for example irfan habib marx and his followers had not only questioned and criticized the racism of colonial administrators and orientalist scholars but also contributed uh, to the anti colonial movements in various countries uh, including uh, ireland india tanzania uh, etc ahmed points out again uh, as quite correctly uh, that the very passages that say it singled out as instances of cultural parochialism uh, from marx writings or other uh, revolutionary leaders writings could easily be read in a different way as describing not the superiority of western culture but the brutality of the colonial rule uh, for instance uh, scholars have pointed out that said has misinterpreted a particular quote uh, from marx writing and this particular quote is from marx's famous work the 18th brumaire of louis bonaparte and this quote uh, goes like this uh, they cannot uh, represent themselves they must be represented so uh, this is a part of a quote uh, taken from uh, the 18th brumaire of louis bonaparte uh, by said and uh, you must be remembering this 
Said actually begins uh, his book by this quote. And uh, an innocent reader might think that Marx was talking about the Eastern people uh, here uh, when, when he says they cannot represent themselves, uh, they must be represented. And it is an instance of cultural parochialism or uh, patronization. But in reality, the context of that quote is uh, completely different. And this is uh, pointed out uh, not only by Aijaz Hamad, but also by various other Marxist scholars. So uh, they say that the Marxist scholars have argued that the context of this quote is completely different. Marx was making this claim uh, in the context of the 19th century rural France uh, when he was talking about the small peasants and uh, the oppressions they have faced uh, at that particular historical period. So uh, this, this characterization is considered to be highly misleading and uh, problematic. And I, I don't think, I, I don't, uh, I, for our purposes, we don't need to uh, go to the actual context of the court and what it actually meant and uh, what was uh, Marx, uh, what was uh, the uh, intentions of Marx uh, when he used this passage. And uh, if you are more interested in this, I would suggest uh, you to read this uh, famous and very interesting work uh, by Marx, uh, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. The third important criticism uh, raised by Aizas Ahmed uh, against Said's work is that Said has displaced the materialist explanations of colonial rule by culturalist explanations. Uh, for instance, the conventional accounts of colonial expansion had uh, focused on uh, the interest groups, classes, and state managers as its moving forces. Uh, for example, uh, Marxist, uh, for Marxists, uh, it had been uh, the capitalist. For nationalist, it had been the British interest. And for liberal, it was uh, overly ambitious political leaders or, or national figures. What all these explanations had in common was the central role that they accorded to the material interest as the motivating factor in colonial rule. But um, if in fact Orientalism uh, is a body of ideas that guides colonialism and its, and its interest, uh, as Said's second argument would suggest, then it is not the interest that drive the colonial project, but a deeply rooted cultural disposition, uh, a discourse. And here the discourse of Orientalism. The implications it had for the study of colonialism are profound. Post said, uh, colonialism appear uh, not as the consequences of developments particular to uh, a certain era, certain historical processes, but as an expression of a deeper ontological divide between the East and the West uh, as, a, a, as a symptom uh, of the cultural orientation of Europe's inhabitants. Again, uh, rather than demolishing the problematic binary between the East versus West, Said comes to reinforce it in the opposite way. And this is uh, similar uh, to the criticism uh, that was made uh, by uh, Sadiq Jalal al uh, when he said that uh, Said is producing uh, Orientalism in reverse or Said's arguments accidentally reinforces the binary uh, between East and West. And uh, this is an important criticism uh, that we have to keep in mind, even when we admire the erudition and the literary quality of Said's work. Uh, so uh, these are the two important and earlier criticisms of Said's work. Uh, but recently, uh, Vivek Chibber, a well-known Marxist sociologist, uh, has uh, argued that while Aija Sahamad and uh, Sadiq Jalal al uh, were able to capture the limitations or uh, the problems in Said's work, they failed to observe something else. That is uh, Said's second argument uh, that Orientalism is not simply a consequence of colonialism, but importantly one of its causes. And that argument uh, was contradicted 
by Said's own evidences he used in his work. Uh, but more or less, uh, Chibber is also making claims similar to that of uh, Aija Sahamad, uh, but uh, just uh, qualifying uh, qualified the critique uh, by pointing out that the evidences brought by Said uh, itself contradicts his arguments. I don't think uh, we need to go into detail uh, of uh, Vivek Chibber's criticism, but I have used uh, Chibber's essay uh, to prepare uh, for this class and it's a, it's a wonderful essay and those who are interested in Said's work must also read uh, this wonderful essay by Vivek Chibber, uh, The Dual Legacy of Orientalism. And uh, not just Vivek Chibber's work, but also Sadiq Jalal Alism's and Aija Sahmat's article. Uh, they are very important and interesting. Uh, I hope uh, those who find uh, Said and his work, uh, his arguments interesting, will also read these uh, interesting uh, criticisms. I would like uh, to end this class uh, by sharing uh, something that we should keep in mind uh, when we engage uh, with the criticism of uh, such a fascinating uh, text like Orientalism. And this quote is from an interview uh, with a famous uh, French philosopher, Gilles Deleuze. And uh, in this context, uh, he was talking about the works of Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. But I think that uh, this is equally applicable to any giants in any field. Uh, including Said and his uh, magnum opus. So the quote goes like this. Uh, when you are facing such a work of genius, uh, there is no point in saying you disagree. First, you have to know how to admire. Uh, you have to rediscover the problems he poses, his particular machinery. It is through admiration that you will come to genuine critique. You have to work your way back to those problems which an author of genius has posed, all the way back uh, to that which he does not say in what he says, in order to extract something that still belongs to him, though you also turn it against him. You have to be inspired, uh, visited by the geniuses you uh, renounce. And uh, this is something uh, that I find really fascinating. And I think it is important that we keep this in our mind uh, whenever we engage with any important works in our field. Thank you.